Have you ever had an unexplainable moment with music? Was there a time when a song felt completely synchronistic in your life? Was that a coincidence? Or was it a coexistence? Today, I invite you on an extraordinary journey into the realm of harmonious encounters where music and spirituality intertwine. Join me as we unravel this deep and mystical connection between those two things, music and spirituality. It's all right here on Music Ghost Stories. Welcome to another episode of Music Ghost Stories, where we talk about music and its synchronicity in our lives. I'm Donnie, your host, and today we're exploring the spiritual side of music with a very special guest. On episode one, I told the story of when my dad passed away and how his voice echoed to me through music. On this episode, Justin, our guest, shares personal stories and insights into how he's adopted his father's spiritual outlook and how remaining in an open mindset can unlock wisdom and creativity. We'll discuss the legacy of Justin's dad, who sought healing through music, and how his messages of compassion and unconditional love still resonate today. You know, it's funny. The song my dad was singing to when he said goodbye is the song in which Justin's dad sang the actual lead vocal on the Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds. Everyone, let's welcome Justin Carl Wilson. Justin, welcome to the podcast. I want to thank you for taking the time to document what I think is a bit of history. Cool. Thank you. And thank you for reaching out. It is my pleasure. It's been a pleasure to meet you. And I look forward to speaking to you and your audience. Let's tell the people a little bit about who you are. Well, my name is Justin Wilson. I was born in 1971. So I'm uh, early 50s here as we speak. And my father was Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys, he was the youngest of the three Wilson brothers, was Brian, Dennis, and Carl, my dad. He was the baby. I play and write music. You know, I'm a musician. My wife and I have three beautiful kids, two high schoolers and a little guy, six and a half. Our kids and our family, there is nothing more important to me and there's no words for the love you feel. So I'm so grateful and so thankful. You and I share a common theme, which is, I think, the relationship between music, family, and legacy. What is one aspect of your father's talent or his personality that you think often goes overlooked or underrated? His sense of humor, I think, is something that is lost on most and for good reason. You know, he was very centered. He was very grounded. And so I think that he came across in kind of a serious manner and when it came to his music and the Beach Boys music, he was dead serious about it. Yeah. And he cared. I think it's fair to say that no one cared more than him in them playing their best and putting on the best show they can, staying present in the music. That was a big one for him. It would be a thorn in his side when he felt that people weren't being present on stage and in in the moment. I mean you play these songs thousands of times who who could blame anyone for maybe wandering off mentally or, or whatever the case, to bring it back. He had a great sense of humor. It, it was very dry. He would deadpan his jokes and it might take you a split second to go, oh, he's kidding now. I see. <laughs> but no, he was hilarious. Great sense yeah. of humor, wonderful father, very present with whoever he was with. Oh, a wonderful human being. My wife got me a Christmas present. I unwrapped it and it's a guitar pick from the Beach Boys. And I was like, was this used by the Beach Boys? And I look on the back and it says Wilson, but it doesn't say Carl Wilson, which sort of alludes to your father's sense of humor. It says, of course, Cookie Wilson. (laughs) This is such a perfect segue, Donnie, because that's exactly it. That was his sense of humor. Right. And it's just him kind of making fun of himself or just being ridiculous. It's my Christmas cookie. That's so funny (laughs) when I'm saying his sense of humor 
I, right. It didn't even dawn on me. Like, oh yeah, do you have the Cookie Wilson pick? And that's a total joke that he's making of yeah. himself. Ah, oh, that's that's perfect. What's interesting is I asked her. I said, "Did you get this after I I told you that Justin reached out to me?" And she said, "No." I was like. That's a little bit of a coincidence, if you ask me. That's great. And all on his birthday, I thought, you know, what What better That's day right. to call it to reach back out to Donnie than, than on my dad's birthday? I That's that right. Was on, the- on the 21st. And my dad yeah. was also born on the 21st. That was something that we shared. That's right. Uh, and and, and you're 18. Right? That's right. You're the 18th and I'm the 18th. Oh, right. wow. Very funny. I yeah. love it. What is your best memory of music? Oh, my gosh. There's just so much. It's like a through line through our lives and our childhoods. The first image that comes to mind is the tagging along, just being on the side of the stage and I'd have a pass so I could get around. And as I got older, I would do a lap, like a slow lap around the arenas and just stop in different spots of the arena. And he was always real curious to ask, how did it sound? Just like any other guy in a band, how did we sound? Yeah. <laughs> and it was always like, it sounded great. But it's like, you're there before the show. And the lights are dark and you're like in a 10,000, 15,000 seat arena. The lights drop and then they announce them from Southern California, the Beach Boys and the big roar. And then they would usually go into California Girls was seemed to be the first song of the set usually. But it was after his passing in 98. A few years after that, I got more into their catalog. I, I hadn't really listened to all of their albums like in earnest. i would go out and hear their live show and they would play the hits, you know, the surfing songs and the car songs and all that stuff. But when I got into albums like 2020 and Friends and Holland and Sunflower, I was like, whoa, surf's up. And I had heard these songs throughout my childhood, but I hadn't really placed them in my mind. And that I think think is where my love for the Beach Boys music grew deeper, for sure. I loved hearing the live stuff and it was fun and it makes you feel good, which I think is part of what we're talking about today, too, just the the spirit of the music and how it makes you feel and why we do it and all that kind of stuff. So those are my very early memories and then discovering their catalog later. Was there a song of your dad's, whether it's Beach Boys or his solo stuff, that sort of grabbed you when you were listening in that era? That's a good question. From an early age, a song that stuck with me through the years that I still love so much is Time to Get Alone. It's just a beautiful, it's like a a love song, like a sweet, sweet love song, not a ballad, but um, I believe it might even be a waltz, if I'm not mistaken. Angel Come Home is another one. When I was young, 10, 11, 12, I used to be in my bedroom and play that over and over. And I just loved it so much. Written by our dad and Dennis sang it. Then some songs off of his solo stuff that were great. Heaven is, he, they used to do a song called Heaven. Yeah. The Beach Boys would, um, would, would do that. They would do God Only Knows pretty much every night. And then Heaven would be one of those that would rotate in and out. You mentioned, I think, that you were listening to Holland. Yeah. The more I sort of looked into the Beach Boys... Your dad started standing out more and more. I started to learn about your dad's producer's role. And it led me to Beach Boys Holland because your dad produced that with uh, Jack Riley. And they actually went to Holland. Yeah, I love it. And I believe it is the first track of Steamboat, I think. Is, I listened uh, to that last night. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It, it's just so gorgeous. I, I love it so much. They did this cool thing with several songs where Carl would write the song. And then Dennis would sing it, like Angel Come Home. And then conversely, Dennis wrote a few songs that, that Carl would sing. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, a yeah. little brotherly thing. And um, yeah, I, I love that era. The, the more obscure stuff, I'll call it, by the Beach Boys. For me, anyway, I think that's where the essence of the band lies. More so than the early 60s surfing stuff, which is great. And it's yeah. fun. Like I said, it makes you feel good. And all that good stuff. But for me personally, like the deeper, the better for a deep connection or a deep meaning or to really feel it in that way. People are recognizing even today that the Beach Boys had this whole different side to them that resonates. And all the recordings that your dad did as a professional, 
was actually such a blessing that you can just go and listen to them whenever you want. I'm haunted to this day. My dad was a songwriter too. I can hear them in my head, but I can't play them anywhere. Those things that your dad created being documented and captured in like the best way possible is really just such a honor and a blessing to be able to tune into that whenever you want. I couldn't agree more. To be in holiday season and be out and hear Little St. Nick or just throughout the year, you hear these songs out in the public or on a commercial or whatever. You can do a YouTube thing, a deep dive, and I can go and watch interviews and listen to interviews of him speaking. Mm -hmm. And that, the music and the singing it is wonderful and I love it and it's great. But to be able to hear his speaking voice, there's something that I maybe appreciate even more so about that, which might sound a little strange considering the the depth of their catalog and what he did musically but to hear a speaking voice is just special on my phone i could hit a couple buttons and then there he is talking and so absolutely i am so blessed in, in that way and yeah no that has not been lost on me for years it's oh my gosh i, I can't even believe how lucky i am in that way yeah it's interesting that you say that yeah. this past christmas we went over to my uncle's house and he has a little bar in his basement I just love going down there and hearing stories about my dad because yes. that's my dad's brother. And I was like, that's what I love about it because my one sibling is my older sister. So I feel like when I'm hearing these stories from my uncle, I'm learning about my dad as a brother, not a father. And now we're starting to sync up. And this is probably what you experienced that you totally just blew my mind with is that since he's passed, stories about him bring his age down and down because you're going into the past. And as I get older, eventually we sync up and I'm imagining my dad as my age. It's really fascinating. And you get to tune into that on YouTube, which is just even <laughs> crazier. I know. I know I spoke of how young he was when the Beach Boys got going, but I'm now older than my dad was when he passed by a little bit more than a year or so. Mm. And yeah, it is just a trip, like you said, how your timelines move closer and closer and then they intersect and oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So to dive back into that resonance, have you ever had an emotional reaction, maybe even tears listening to music in some way? The short answer is yes, absolutely. Many times. <laughs> oh my gosh. I would say that the number one instance of that to answer that question directly is it was shortly after his passing he passed in february of 98 and and i was home alone in the hollywood hills and not too far from the bowl and i was listening to lenny kravitz he was a big influence on me just falling in love with the idea of actually doing it i was like oh my god like lenny was just the coolest he still is i, I think he's awesome but anyway, he lost his mom early and he wrote a song, I believe it's called Thinking of You. And I was listening to that and I, I probably played it over and over and oh my gosh, I don't know that I've ever cried so hard. Mm. Listening to that song, Lenny singing to his mom that had since passed and Thinking of You, oh my gosh, it was like a conduit. And I was like, man. If I ever come across Lenny or meet him, I would just have to thank him because it was like, I will never forget those moments. And and yeah, that song by by him was, was a big one for me mm -hmm. in that moment. And he had just passed recently, so it was all really right there. And it yeah. was the key at that moment. And it's happened since. Yeah, yeah. But that's one, one great example of no. timing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It could really just bring out such strong emotions. and. Do you think that Lenny Kravitz song, what really pulled you at that time? Do you think it was the music or do you think it was the lyrics of that song? Yeah, I think it was the spirit of it. I really do. So it's all of the above, I think. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, yes, it was absolutely the lyrics. It was the message in mm -hmm. it. I would agree with that. But it was the feeling. It was like I could tap in to how he was feeling. And that relationship that he had with his mom felt so similar. It felt like we're, this is like a parallel thing here. And he was singing and saying what I was feeling. 
that's like the thing about music that just does it for us. And like I said, like the soundtracks to our lives. And that was probably my most powerful experience with that, to answer that question. What is your insight on how music achieves that deep interconnection? To go back to my dad and what he might say, a lot of what I have come to believe, he was telling me the whole time, but it took a while for me. It took into my 20s to where it's like, oh, I see what he meant. And his answer was basically because people are spirit, like we are spirit. And he believed also that music is spirit. It's like a living, it's like a living thing. Songs and music is, you know what I mean? It's, it is spirit. So if we are spirit and music is spirit, and then it's a natural connection, or like you said, there's a synchronicity there. Not every song is going to do it for you, but the ones that do, I think that can really lend itself to that, that deep connection, that deep meaning, the deep feeling. Real quick. Did you know that Music Ghost Stories has a group on Facebook? You can join and share any coincidences that you've experienced involving music in some way. We want to hear your story and how music has played a synchronistic role in your life. So, with each episode right here on this podcast, there's a description. And there's notes involving each episode in some way. I try to put things that are unique to the episode, like a playlist of the songs that are referenced, for example. But also, you'll find the link that takes you to that community on Facebook. Check it out, click it when we're done, and I'll meet you over there. All right. I've never really heard that music is its own spiritual entity, and that's like kind of mind-blowing to me. I've heard before, like, musicians sometimes are nothing but an antenna. I've heard yeah. a few interviews. Yeah, and what they do is they receive these signals and all they're doing is they're giving it a vessel to to travel. Like I said, the podcast is just this capture and release. Some musicians have that outlook saying, that's what music is. I'm just capturing wherever it comes from. Who knows? And I'm just releasing it for other people to hear. Some people say it's not even their music. They're like, it ain't mine. I just, I made it, but it came from somewhere else. And your dad saying that it's its own spirit is really unique. And I think very, very cool. How would you define your spiritual outlook? I think similarly to his, I never found him to be a very religious person, but oh my gosh, he was probably the most spiritual person that I've ever known. And I think in that a lot of his messages and the things that he would say over and over had a lot to do with compassion and empathy, understanding of just our fellow humans and that we're all doing the best we can. And one thing that I've said this before, but if you knew their story and what they've been through and maybe the pain they've felt and just what they are dealing with in their own humanness, that you would love them like your own and you would have great compassion and empathy and understanding for that person. And he really walked the walk with that. And being a young kid, I'm sure I complained to him a million times about him, different situations or people. And it was funny. He tended to be the balance. It was hardly ever in agreement with me. It was wanting to show me that there is another view of this or there's another way to look at this or understand it. And he really carried that understanding or that thing that people are just doing the best they can in this life with maybe their circumstance or what they're dealing with. Who who knows? We don't know. You never know what the person in the other car has gone through that day or what they're dealing with or the person that might be rubbing you the wrong way or you're not on the same page because they have a whole other life experience. And so just to be careful not to judge that because we don't know. And so I think he came from a place of compassion, empathy, understanding all that. I was imagining a video I saw. I don't know if it was some science video or something. I guess it's about water and the characteristics of water where the game was like you go around in a circle and everybody's pouring water into a cup, right? And the glass is full of water and now it's your turn and you're like, oh man, if I pour water in here, it's going to... And then what they do is they do the tiniest little drop and the glass does not overflow. 
And then it's the next person's turn. I'm like, oh, no way. They're getting water in there. And then they go and it's just more water. And it's soon the surface tension will break and that glass will overflow. But it made me think that you're like, no way is water getting poured in this glass. And your dad has this little cup of love, unconditional love. And he says, no, look, there's always room. And he just, boop, just a little splash. Right, you know? right. And, and and I think music could be a vessel for unconditional love. That's really neat. Something I saw about your dad, someone quoted him saying that Brian, your uncle Brian, would actually write down prayers on paper. And your dad said we would pray for guidance to make the most healing sounds. Wow. And I, I thought that was really incredible. And this is, I'm going to plug a previous episode of the podcast here because I started to dive into music therapy and how music has these healing aspects and like how science has proven music and how we've created scanning of the brain and how they're analyzing the brain during certain parts involving music. And that was on episode three. And I learned that there are healing aspects of music. And that's like recent studies that are proving that. But back in the era of pet sounds was well before I think the technology understood that. It really stands out that they were requesting that their music have this healing aspect. That's amazing. Yeah, I I had heard or was aware that there was some amount of prayer or spiritual connection as they worked in the studio or maybe before they started working, like you're saying. But I don't think I've ever heard it put in those terms that they were praying for healing. That is remarkable. So you being a musician and having all this wisdom passed down to you, doing your own thing when you're creating, performing, have you ever tried to apply that in your music or have you ever felt it while you were paving your own path musically. Yeah, the spirituality in it. I mean, it makes me think more of, we were talking about the music and being spirit. You know, when you are playing, it could be someone else's music or your own or whatever. I, I imagine that you could relate to it where you're playing the song and it takes on a life of its own. You're not really playing it as much as you're along for the ride. And I think the spirit of it and the life of the music can be felt in those moments. Maybe that's where I'm feeling the spirituality. So I'm not thinking about it so much. Like I said, I don't want to overthink, but the feeling of it is you're along for the ride of your own song. When you're creating music, you know, there's a part of your brain that recognizes patterns and maybe you want to imitate those that inspire you. It's hard to stay open to what just comes to you. Yeah. And then not to mention that you play it enough times or whatever it is, and then the happy mistakes come. And those are oh, always yeah. like the coolest. You're like, oops, didn't mean to do that. Ooh, that was pretty cool. I yeah. I'll keep it. Yeah. I'm the sure good... that's happened to all of us. Yeah. The lucky mistakes. The lucky mistakes. <laughs> yeah. There right. You. Here's a good one. Have you ever experienced an odd coincidence involving music in some way? I can't recall a specific instance of that. But the one that, that I think of is I was doing this little show in a club in Santa Monica and I felt my dad's presence. I thought I did anyway. I was playing. I wasn't sure, but I don't know. And I, th- I think it was something technical went wrong. I think I had to like restring like in the middle of the show or, or something like embarrassing or awful or whatever. And then after one of my good friends came up to me and he was like, I thought I felt your pops tonight or something. I was like, oh my gosh. It was so cool and interesting that he recognized that so separately from me. You know, I'm up on the stage playing and and he's just there, but he felt his presence as I did. I can't prove it, but you know, it felt like it. And then, yeah, I threw that little anecdote into lyrics, into a a song later. Oh, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. Would you say that music transcends time? Yeah, I, I think so. It's interesting. I'm thinking of music in like in a visceral sense, like where you really feel like, oh my God, this is like a real thing that I'm feeling or going through that when you connect to the music and that kind of thing. And like we said earlier, it can transport you back to your childhood, to different places on the earth. So yeah, absolutely. I do. I believe it's transcends time. In what ways do you think 
your dad and the Beach Boys continue to resonate with newer generations in terms of its spiritual and emotional impact? I guess maybe it's songs don't have to be, or music doesn't have to be popular to make you feel a certain way, but something in their music obviously has resonated with generations, literally, and millions upon millions of of people. So there's something in there. I think Brian said one time, the family that sings together is family that stays together. Mm -hmm. It was just his musical spin on it. I think it's like all of the above. And I think we're all given our God-given gifts. And I don't know, some resonate more than others, or some are destined more than others. Like Prince comes to mind. Oh my gosh. He was an absolute vessel of a higher something. Yeah. And just his musicianship and the way it, it came through him. And so not everyone is born Prince. Not everyone is born Lennon and McCartney or Brian Wilson or Bach or Beethoven or, you know what I mean? So I would be fascinated to hear the quantum physics of it or to be hear it on a metaphysical yeah explanation because i don't know i i just i think it's everything or all of the above maybe it might be as simple as just keeping an open mindset when you're getting ready to make one of the biggest records of all time unknowingly mind you and you're asking the abyss to just like hey make sure what we're doing has meaning it's yeah just- absolutely you said open and I think that's a key word there, I, to remain open. I think whether it was Brian and or all the Beach Boys, I think, especially Brian probably, in being able to channel all of that and his genius, but he remained open. He was open to the possibilities, to experimenting with sound. And they took such a hard left turn. Like the Beatles were kind of like a gradual you know, from their early beginnings to Sergeant Peppers, they, it's like they took steps and they graduated yeah. to each one. The Beach Boys just were like, Burr! and they took that gnarly turn. And then here they are with Pet Sounds. And I think it was probably impossible for everyone to digest that. And now it's considered one of the greatest albums of all time. But like you said, I think to remain open is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And something that I'm sure we could all do more of, whether it's you're open to my ideas, I'm open to yours and we're sharing and it's great. And I'm having a, a good time learning as we go and, and, and staying open. I, I think that's a, I think that's a big key, actually, you know, open to the possibilities that, that this other person is going through some stuff. And I don't know what that is. So let me, don't limit my experience with my own constraint. I'll say that to my kids. Stay open to the possibility that you might have a good time if you do this. Yeah. So uh, yeah, absolutely. With music, with people, you know, on like a spiritual level, just to, to remain open. That's a good theme for today. This one's a little bit more of an interesting scenario, I should say. All right. Imagine you're creating a time capsule <laughs> with, with your dad. And he says... Okay. He said, hey, Justin, just me and you today, we're going to go out and we're going to leave something. We're going to bury it in the ground for the future to see, like generations later. I I need you to pick three things. What would you put in this time capsule that when someone opens it up, it would maybe be a picture of you and your dad and these three things? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) The first thing that came to mind, just because we're talking so much about music, and how technology has changed. My first thought was the boom box. I haven't had one of those since the 80s or the 90s, but it was like, yeah, kids or people might look at that. You might look at that today. And go, what the heck? I, I got one right. Hold on. Is it oh, right? there you go. Right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I saw that in a Beastie Boys video once. No, that's awesome. Gosh, that's a great question. I've got music on my mind and I thought of vinyl as well. It's like technology is everywhere it's just you can't escape it we're all tied to it we are using it right now even like a phone like your iphone it's like it's like we're all walking around with these supercomputers and then in 50 100 years you might look at this like we look at the boom box i, I don't know i or <laughs> we'll be a phone <laughs> yeah like no, i know i thought they'll just insert the chip into yeah. wherever i will and, be the phone uh, 
Yeah, and you just walk down the street looking like a maniac, talking yeah. to your buddy with nothing, talking into nothing. That's so funny. Yeah, I don't know, something like that. Or like a like a really cool picture of, um, you know, like the globe or, so, or something beautiful, like beautiful scenery or something with nature. Mm. Because I'm always thrilled when they don't do more developing, like yeah. around here. Like I, I grew up in Santa Monica and oh my gosh, they have overdeveloped it. And it I is... Bet. It'll never be the same. And it's kind of sad. You know, I, I loved growing up there in the late 70s and, and 80s. And, and, it, and it's just been overdeveloped, in, in my opinion. I think that's why my dad gravitated towards, he moved to Colorado, mm. moved up into, up into the Rockies, first on Caribou Ranch, where who's who of people recorded records there, like Chicago, the Beach Boys, Michael Jackson, Joe Walsh, it goes on and on. And so he went up there to work at Caribou fell in love with it and just, I just think he liked the peace, the serenity. And so he chose to live there full time when he wasn't on the road, he was in Colorado and he would come to LA to visit me and my brother and spend, and his mom, like our grandma Audrey and spend time with family. But, but that's really where he wanted to be up on the mountains. Maybe some cool pictures of, of unmolested earth, just the sheer beauty of God's beautiful earth. That kind of thing would be cool to include. I love where you're going with this because something that I think makes maybe the Beach Boys stand out is that the time in which they were creating their music was much more tangible. I was showing my buddy, for instance, I had a record player. I unplugged it from the wall and handed him the cord. And he was holding the cord and I was spinning <laughs> the, re the record. And I said, right. do you hear that? And he was like, yeah, where is it coming from? He didn't understand. And I said, you're holding the power cord. It's not plugged in. And he said, Oh, and he was like, what? How is that possible? And he was mind blown. And I was too. That's why I was sharing it with him because I had just restored my dad's record player. I was really into this whole thing. There's a producer, Steve Albini. Have you heard of him? He worked with Nirvana. I have. Absolutely. He always records to tape because he believes that the recording process is meant to be a document in history. Same thing. Like I'm capturing this for future generations. But he said that tape is interesting because it can be played back through nature. So you can, mm. man, you can man make something to play this tape back. So in a situation where there's no computers or whatever, he doesn't want to rely on technology. He wants to make sure that the future can hear it through the world. So he always preserves it on tape. And I thought that was interesting as well. And then you mentioned nature and overdevelopment, which just I was talking about this before with you. That song off of Holland called The Traitor that just kind of stood out to me. I want to send you, if you haven't seen where I sort of like made this announcement to friends and family, like, oh, I'm going to be a dad. I used it as a way to remember my dad. When I was creating that, I was playing a record while I was working and the, that song, The Trader came on. I didn't even know what song it was. I had to go back on the record and find it. Like I moved the needle. I'm like, which one is it? And, <laughs> but that song, the theme is about overdevelopment and yearning for simpler times like nature. Just that talks about uh, the breeze, the river, and the beauty in which, like, you had it in the beginning when you didn't overthink it, when you were just nothing but an open mind. Yeah, absolutely. And that also brings to mind a Dennis song, one of my favorites, the river song off of Pacific Ocean Blue. It is very much the same message and the same theme and wanting to get out of the city and just wanting to be like the river, just be out in, in nature and all that. He probably wrote that song in 1975. Mm. And by 1980, my dad couldn't stand to be in LA anymore because of all the people. So it's funny that, that Carl and Dennis, among other things, shared that same love of nature. And Dennis was a real waterman. Like you said, he was the surfer of the group. Surfing at an early age, he just loved to be on the water, whether it be sailing, or I remember those summers tagging along, my dad would probably be back in the hotel meditating and I would, and I'd be out with my uncles, Billy and, and uncle Dennis out on the local lake with some locals that were more than happy to take some of the beach boys out on the lake and go water skiing and that kind of thing. So I, I do have those memories of being with him as well, but yeah, no, he was just like an avid waterman and yeah, he, he, he was awesome. Rugged guy. Awesome, awesome guy. Everyone that yeah. I feel like everyone that, that talks about him, that knew him, just has such a great love for him. Similar to my dad. Yeah. Very different people, but, but held in 
high regard and a lot of love there. That's a heavy question or, or scenario, I should say, but I love what you thought of. I didn't even think about something like with nature. You just assume that nature is just a part of it, but it's not necessarily true. The overdevelopment, like someone might open that time capsule, have some tangible piece of music. Like what even is this in, in like a whole digital world and just nature? It might just be like, that's, I don't know. It's so thought provoking. I think that's really neat. If you could write a song with your dad today, what message would you want it to send to the world? All the things that he taught me or all the th- all the messages that he told me over and over, whether it's to, about understanding, compassion, love, love is a big one. And also like being open, like you said, I, I think that kind of goes along with all of it. So all of those, all those things that we've been talking about, I think something along those lines that would touch on those. And I've already written, um, you know, it's like, it's funny. I used to think half of the songs are either about him or things that, that he taught me. I've written lyrics that are like quasi verbatim of what he would say to me over and over as a child, just trying to show me that the other perspective or to maybe have some more understanding. And so I have put those into some songs already, but, uh, to do that with him would be special. And I would probably just stay right there, like on those themes. Hmm. One of the songs that haunts me that I hear my dad playing on the piano and singing downstairs is let love be the answer. That was the theme of the song. Let Hmm. love be the answer. Yeah. It was the chorus. So I'll have to dig it up or try to make it again. I think you and I also share that our dads were pretty advanced. And it's hard to keep up with them. So I crave my dad as a partner because the talent, it seems like they have a strength or like a superpower. And it's like, man, I I could use some of that when I'm creating. I was just, I was just getting going with, with the band. We were just a little three piece. And so I was able to share what we were doing. And and really right before he passed, it was just a couple of weeks. I brought a a VHS uh, tape of of like our first show that we did in uh, the beginning of 98. And, and he, he watched it and yeah, he was digging it and they made a comment or two, always super supportive, very supportive. And then there was one, we were down in Palm Springs in a family home there and I kept playing the same C chord over. I can't remember exactly what it is, but anyway, I just kept playing it over. I love the way it sounds. And he, he walked by and he stopped in the doorway and I was just playing it over and over. He probably felt okay, might be time to a change. And he recommended, he's like, you know, you could do an F there. That would make sense. <laughs> but I was like, and so I did, I was like, oh my God, I was like, genius. I never would have thought. That was in the very beginning. That was really early on, but it was like yeah. mind bending, the simplicity of it. And it was all like the back of his hand. Yeah. And I think the one thing that I was like, oh, I wish if I could pick his brain and talk for hours and hours, just about harmony, just with the music, because him and Al Jardine, specifically are like locked in the middle of all those Beach Boys harmonies. You know, you have Brian is the falsetto. He's on top and Mike is the bass and he's down low and you can pick those out pretty easily, but then you hear this wall of sound or this big chunky sound. And while you can hear the high and the low, that middle binds it. And some of those harmonies are so complex and like you would never really guess to have to hear him be picked apart a little bit. Yeah, if I could pick his brain on just harmonies of what, what, what was your part on that song? I've heard his part on Surfer Girl is a really, really cool part. I thought, oh, that'd be fun maybe to record that, you know. I'll, I'll just share a brief story. We went on yeah. vacation when I was a kid and I said, I'm going to the beach. I had a skateboard. I would just do my own thing. I was a teenager at that time. I was like, what's dad going to do? And dad had a little tape recorder that had a great feature that he loved, cassette tape recorder. The best feature, he called it Q Review. That's what you have to get because you could have play and rewind would do the little, you know what I'm talking Mm -hmm. about? And he would, he spent his time taking the Beach Boys, the Lord's Prayer, and he would notate it and he would break down the harmonies. I think he was fascinated by not the top, not the, the bottom, but what's happening in the middle there that I can't really, I can't really pick out. Because it's such a seamless blend. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Man, that takes a special ear it to does. even be able to do that. So I imagine your dad must have had a great ear. He, so that. 
it goes, I thought about this briefly when you said like a God given talent, my dad started out tone deaf. He says, he, wow. he, yeah, I think what he was given was passion when music resonated with him, especially the beach boys, he was just on a mission, just like you said, like you're so curious about it. And he just went out and got it. Whatever he learned along his journey, I wish he could just show me certain things. But what echoes with me is like, just because he's gone doesn't mean you, you can't still get there. When I come away from this conversation we had, I think my mindset's really going to just be a lot more open. For my little studio endeavors here, is there any wisdom that you've learned or your dad's passed down that I can apply for mix downs or studio stuff? Tips and tricks? You know, or? Yeah, the one little thing that he told me is make sure you make sure. I remember he just told me that make sure you make sure, make sure you're, I don't know, rehearsed or you have all your ducks in a row. That was one of his other sayings he would say is that you want to have your ducks in a row. And I think that's part and parcel with make sure you make sure. So wow. you're you, like you set yourself up for success. I think like when I was doing the gig and I, I think that it was like my fault. I think that if the string didn't break, I think my backup guitar wasn't tuned. Or something. I think I had a part in that because I think I did not make sure to make sure that time. Maybe that was the time where I felt his presence. Yeah, I was thinking that and your buddy was but, like, oh man, we didn't make sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I don't know. I don't know how that relates to your own thing. It looks like you're set up pretty well and all that stuff. But yeah, I just think in your endeavors or whatever you're doing, and I think that you've either done your homework or nice and prepared and all that. I definitely get that feeling. I think you've already done it. I think you did make sure you make sure today. It's great advice. Normally it's trust, but verify type of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think make sure you make sure is so much <laughs> like, it's a, it's a better way of saying it. All right. Well, final thing, best episode of Music Ghost Stories in the future. What does it look like to you? I don't even know. It's it's li possibilities are limitless. I did send an email to Neil Tyson. Oh uh, yeah, Neil yeah. DeGrasse. But yeah, th then there's my short answer. There because you go. that would him because or someone like him because that would be really interesting to hear someone with a scientific understanding and and mind to be able to break it down in those terms. I I think that would be fascinating. I'm gonna my, go for it. That's such a good perspective to have. You know, we talked obviously a lot about my dad and the Beach Boys and my own experience, but yeah, we didn't even speak so much about kind of your connection to the Beach Boys through your parents and, and that whole thing. That's really what led us to meeting yeah. and, and that whole thing. So, I mean, that was also, I think, an important piece in your own journey and all that stuff. Yeah. Like you said, like music was the spirit. It reached my dad and through legacy, that spirit was passed down to me led me to putting a pen in my hand and writing on a piece of paper. I'm so glad that you did reach out and yeah, maybe even happier that I reached back, you know, and that we yeah. got to connect and, and it's really cool. So it's been a pleasure. And yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Yeah. Awesome. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much, okay. Justin. All right, man. Take care. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye -bye. See ya. Bye -bye. In the presence of Carl's son, Justin, we've delved into the very essence of Carl's genius. His ability to infuse every note with passion, every lyric with emotion. As we bid farewell to this episode, let us not forget the man behind the melodies, the soul behind the harmonies. Carl's legacy isn't just etched into the grooves of vinyl records. It resonates in the countless moments of joy and solace his music has provided to us. It's in the warmth of the sun, the gentle sway of the evening sea, and the quiet introspection of the stars above you. As we wrap up, let's think about how we can apply an attitude of openness in our own lives, whether through music, conversations with others, or your creative pursuits. Staying receptive to new experiences may lead us to unexpected places of insight and connection. Thanks for listening to Music Ghost Stories. Until next time, though this episode is over, keep listening. <laughs>